So in this video, I'm going to explain how this door, the 340 block reserveless 5x5, works in um, in some detail. Um, if you, I'm not going to be building it in this video. I'm going to be doing it in a separate video, which I've already uploaded, um, which is a tutorial where I don't really explain too much, but I um, but I build it. And in this one, I'm explaining it, but not building it. The reason for this is that um, some of the bottom has to be built in an order that it makes less sense for explanation. So I've just thought I'd separate it. Let me know in the comments what you think of this new format. Should I keep it going? But anyway, let's just get straight into it. So we're going to start with the top because it's quite a lot simpler than the bottom. And then we'll go on to the mess of entities and everything that is this bottom circuit. Um, yes, so the main thing that drives the top is this very, very simple burnout circuit. It just consists of a burnout, a dust there, and a piston that powers along. And I'm not going to be explaining the inner mechanics of this because, quite frankly, when we're building, well, at least for me, when I'm building these burnout circuits, or in this case, when I'm taking someone else's, I don't actually really understand what's going on. I just sort of place things and hope for the best. But what I can do is show you in slow motion what this does. So, well, I'll just show you at normal speed first. This will go up to here. Um, which at this point, if we were using a redstone block, this would be kind of annoying because we would have to attract these pistons up. Um, in order to get the redstone block in to power these pistons. But since we're using detector rails, having a gap here is fine. Um, it makes no difference at all. And then what we can do is power it again, and it will fully retract. And if you want to get an idea of what's going on, you know, actually with the torches and everything, then uh, I'll just do this at a slow TPS. Maybe that's a tad slow. I'm doing this with the game speed mod, of course. Links in the description. Yep. And then the retraction is very similar. So we're just going to. It's a very convenient circuit, which means that all of the rest of the top, all it really is, is just controlled circuits based around this tiny little um, torch burnout circuit. And there we go. So, the first thing that we need to talk about is uh, how we're going to power those very bottom pistons. So, up, up to this point, we're powering, we're pushing the pistons all the way down to the bottom, but those pistons aren't actually getting powered. And so, the way we're going to do it is with these detector rails here. So these are going to get pushed in, and so this there'll be a detector rail on this block, which will bud this piston, and then one on this block, which will power this one, bud that one, and update this one. So they all, all three of them get powered. And then it came down to finding a good timing for this. So if this back piston is just extended, we'll worry about this back piston later. Um, a timing that ended up working was having a two tick repeater here. So the, the, the way I approached this was first we wanted to get this side to work because this side um, is difficult to make it independent from the rest of the circuit. So this is going to just be spamming along with the uh, extender. And so it needs to be at a timing where um, it doesn't then break the pistons when it's retracting. So if I just power this real quick you can see this powers more than once. So if I do this, you can see it's pulsing more times and it's going to power these pistons. Um, so we have to get a timing which won't affect that. And this works and it also works as a very nice, very simple swapper. So this will one tick across, one ticking this piston down and then two ticks later, pushing that in, pushing that piston across. And that's obviously just a two tick, so it will retract. And then when it happens in reverse, this will power and this one won't be able to push um, due to various um, immovable objects happening in the door. So it's a very simple system here and the timing just happened to work. And so then on the other side, I just use the same timing since it also works and it would also, the, the timing since it's identical to the other side would update this piston which is only being budded. Now, the, obviously, the big disadvantage of this system is that the pistons get one ticked at the bottom. 
but for a very simple little circuit that's fine because because it's so simple we have plenty of room to come up with a very simple circuit that would refire the just refire it an extra two times to pull the blocks back up again i have an old version of this door um, i'll link it in the description which i'm this was from back when i was working on it in like november where the bottom pistons didn't get one tick they actually got i think they've got 1.5 tick or something um it was a kind of weird system the top itself I had to change it because of something we'll get into later um, but it's not as good as this new one, but it it was a bit faster. The other thing we can see is that it leaves this piston. So if I do this, you can see this piston acts differently, and uh, it's because of it's because of this. So here, if we retract this, you can see this here is going to push in because it's still being powered. And, but luckily what happens is that because it then powers the piston underneath it creates an immovable block which which this can't push down so it doesn't break but it just means we have to be able to retract this for, for when we're doing the final retraction but that's not so bad so this whole circuit is very simple and does most most of it ourselves so next the thing we need to go into is how we're going to repower that burnout a number of times um, also especially before we do that this is the uh, I skipped over this a bit but these mine carts here, um, this is a proper way we we do these ones. These are just placeholders because they're easier to place, a bit less visual mess. But this is how they actually are. So this is sitting on that block there. This mine cart here is the main one that activates the detector rail. And so it's sitting on that mine cart and then it's being blocked from being pushed by the, the by this from here. So this can't be the mine the mine cart can't be pushed that way because of this mine cart. And can't be pulled upwards by those pistons because of this minecart. We don't have to worry about it getting pulled because it's far enough into the block that um, the internal hitbox of the piston arm can't pull it. And this side's very simple. It's just uh, one minecart sitting on top of the other minecart and then the soul sand just to stop it being pulled upwards by this piston because soul sand has several internal hitboxes, one every eighth. Anyway, the refire system. So I've just removed the detector rail system just to make it more clear. And the way, the way it works is quite simple. What we're going to do is place a bunch of items into here, uh, which are going to get pushed up during the uh, during the extender, and then they're going to flow out one at a time from here, creating delay. By which point the cooldown on the burnout will be over, and this will repower the burnout. So say we put eight items in there, which is the amount of pulses that we receive from a torch burnout. That stays on, and then when it turns off, it repowers the burnout, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, since we're using items here, it's very customizable. We can just add more items. So, say we added, um, I don't know, 24, it will repower it three times, like so. Very nice. So, it's a very customizable system in that regard, um, which was extra helpful, so we'll get into later. And there's one other quick thing about this. This is why I'm using a cauldron here rather than a note block, or not a note block, rather than a redstone block. It's so the signal here doesn't power this dust, which would send fewer items from the dropper, which would mess with the system. So just having a three signal strength here means it doesn't interfere. So then what we can do is we can see how we actually apply this in the door. So here we have this. Uh, so the items are in this dropper, but then they go through here. This looks locational because it's a dust powering uh, powering these droppers, but I don't believe that it actually is because it doesn't matter exactly when the items leave. There's a bit of leeway. Um, and so the items get sent into here and then into this hopper, which basically finishes the loop because this one is locked by the input. This is where the lever is for the whole door. And so the items will get stuck in here during the opening and then on the closing they will get sent through here down and back into this and so this actually fulfills two purposes so it does all of the refiring but also it will unpower these back pistons for the double extender at about the right time um, so 26 items for now is not the final amount but it's what we're going to use for now so if i just power this oops that is going to break shit Um, one second. Okay. 
and then two more should do and at this early on during the second one I'll slow this down it's gonna retract that excellent so you can see the bottom piston didn't retract um, so we're gonna to have to deal with the proper retraction of the double at some point but that's how we deal with this part of the retraction and that means given that the given that the piston wasn't there to push this detector rail in again the rest of the extender could retract properly um, so we're getting already quite close to a completed system and we've got quite a lot of space left so next we're going to deal with how we do that final retraction up here and it's very simple so when this here turns off so this here will be on and when this loses its final item we're simply going to have this little um, falling edge monostable on the piston so this will retract and then the torch will repower it so it doesn't form a clock and it will pull up a minecart into this pressure plate like so and it's very important that we use a, a wooden pressure plate we'll get into that later but um, yeah it's a very very simple system to get that to retract and when we apply this to the rest of it we can see we can also attach it straight to the um, to the block swapper so we can hide it in the ceiling because when this retracts we'll, we'll obviously have a gap here and so this will need to re-extend to hide the hole in the ceiling and we can see it does this like so so when the torch turns on it sends the item through and the delay matches up actually very very nicely um, oops I would have just moved the detector rail that's okay so you can see just how nicely this timing works out very little space in it and that's what comes from these extra hoppers so what it means then on the closing is that we're going to just to retract that piston which can have to do this very early and then the items will flow in from our little dropper loop which will extend that back one so let's look into how the rest of the closing is going to work and the rest of the top because it's very simple the way this top works so from the input we have this torch here will power the dropper which will retract the piston that's instant uh, one of the first things that happens in the door um, and that just sets the latch nicely and uh, depowering the lever will also allow the items to flow into here which will get the detector rail into place and also this is a side piston it needs to put that block in um, for the door to be closed and then we're going to deal with the main closing because we store one layer of blocks at the top and it's very very simple the way we do this we simply just power all these pistons here um, so you power the dust um, of course there could be a problem of the dust uh, going across here and then powering these inputs but we get around that very simply simply by putting another piston here which will not only power this side piston but also cancel the signal into the comparator because 15 is bigger than 3 um, and then we'll also send the signal into here which will power the bottom and do the bottom closing um, now this does cause one problem because it means now that when we unpower the piston when we unpower the lever it's going to depower this but because the pistons there are still retracting the very first iteration of the double from this burnout is going to not work and we can see that quite clearly here yeah, it just it breaks but luckily what we can do is because we have a very customizable burnout refi system we can just make it do a whole extra burnout so it'll do five burnouts um, and we do that with 34 items um, which also times this to retract at the right time so it's a very nice system so you can see we have 34 items in there uh, and that's how most of the top works obviously this here will get sent back up from the top from the bottom during the bottom opening this is actually 12 blocks by the way the way we power the side pistons is very very simple we just use these detector rails that get pushed onto stationary minecarts these activate these four pressure plates this detector rail is for the bottom we don't have to worry about that and the way we power the other side pistons is quite neat so we have to power these four and we do it from this piston so this here will push down this and this pressure plate here will now have a minecart on it and is activating these two and then this detector rail can detect uh, minecarts from up to 0 
I think it's eight, seven, five blocks above it. So it can detect that minecart and will power the bottom too, and also that one as well. Um, if we pull these up, you can see this one is now out of the range of the detector rail, and same with the pressure plate. Pressure plates can detect any entity that are less than 0 0.25 blocks above them. Now, if you're wondering how this minecart is even sitting into the into the cauldron, it is um, just being pushed into this one. Now, because minecarts are 0 0.98 blocks across, that means that when you just place one on a rail, there is a one centimeter gap between the edge of it and the edge of the block. Um, and what we can do is just push this minecart into the other one so that it's sitting on one centimeter of the cauldron. So there's plenty of plenty of room for it to sit. Um, and we're also going to use this to, this will be the input to the bottom opening. So when that piston retracts. Now there's one last thing to mention here, and that is the fact that we're using an iron pressure plate here and a wooden pressure plate here. Now these are very important that we have it this way because um, I was having a problem when I first built this that this piston, I, I think this is what the cause was anyway, this piston and this piston could um, retract at the same time and and the updates being different would um, would actually cause the rail to break. It would The update order of the pistons would be wrong and it could break. So when we have a piston pushing rails, we have to power, we have to update the top one before the bottom one. Um, now, I'm not sure whether this will work here. You see here, because it's, because it's using a dust, the look, it's location also the update order is random. So we can see here when we power the when we power this, it actually breaks because the wrong piston is updating first, and it breaks on both the extension and retraction. As you know, well, clearly works there, but on the extension, it, it breaks there, and it can break on the retraction in certain cases, such as this one. Uh, and so to get around that, we just make it so that this here is an iron pressure plate and this here is a wooden one so that this one is always depowering before this one, otherwise the detector rail breaks, which is a bit unfortunate because if this is a wooden pressure plate, the side pistons sort of all turn off in sync, which is nice. And But with an iron one, it's more likely that they will turn off slightly out of sync. There they were in sync, in sync. Uh, stop proving my point is that there you go you can see that one wasn't in sync but it's a very small sacrifice to make for it to you know work but I believe that's most of the details of the top um, and now we're going to get on to the bottom which is significantly more complicated all right so now we're going to get started on the bottom and we're just going to jump straight on with it we're going to have a couple tangents to talk about some of the more interesting de technologies that I used so uh, first the closing. So we're going to look at the input from the top first. So this is um, so the top just comes in from the slider here. Uh, so I've simplified that just to be the piston here. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to push this pigment slightly. So when we press F3 here, we can see that the pigment, which is this inner hitbox here, is slightly within the block. Not enough that it can suffocate. There is a little bit of a of a space where it doesn't suffocate but enough that when you were to, if you push this block down, it will get pushed down a little bit as well. Because if we look here at this example, um, when you have a mob in a minecart and you push it, I'm just gonna slow down the TPS, you can see it gets moved uh, and then will move back into position as soon as, it, as soon as it realizes. Now, but it's not just a visual glitch, it does actually get moved. As you can see, the lamp turned on the hitbox does actually move and this works in any direction it works across or down or up or anything um, in this case we're pushing it down and um, next we're going to talk about the choice of mob which is a zombie pigment so in thin theory you could make this pretty much any mob but a zombie pigment um, I chose because it's convenient and um, it's non-aggressive so this won't attack you by default and it's convenient because um, you can see here that its hitbox sticks out of the bottom this is because it's sitting down in the minecart and I guess Mojang is just a bit too lazy to uh, change the hitbox when it's in a minecart so it just sticks out of the bottom instead and what this means is that it can get pushed down and activate the pressure plate because the pressure plate checks for any entity within a 0.25 above it. So if it's um, more than 0 0.25 of a block above the pressure plate, it won't activate. But when this gets pushed down, it will go into that range. Although, as I was saying, you can make this any other mob pretty much just by putting it slightly, like you could 
make the mob sit a bit lower and push it down but this is convenient because it means it can sit all the way up on this piston okay so that will get pushed down activate the pressure plate and then it will come into this little system so this here is actually locational which is a bit of a shame but that's how it is so I'm going to power all of this row here so this dust here will power that via a bud um, this repeater here powers the bottom one via a bud this is directional and then this here will power that one just straight and then the second row which will be here they will get powered from this dust and those two blocks and then the top row will get powered by this dust here which gets powered from that dropper so we can see when I push this piston down it's going to do that which is pretty simple very nice um, and then we just got one more storage to push up uh, and that's the closing but that's the basics of how this works. Next I'm just going to talk about some interesting mobs you might get into using for if you were to start exploring this mechanic. Um, so some ones with interesting hitboxes we have. So things like pigmen are good because they stick out the bottom. Skeletons stick out the bottom even more and same with wither skeletons and they're also a bit taller than normal skeletons. In terms of tall mobs we also have the Enderman, um, which is a bit flawed in that it um, makes things vertically locational. There's a link in the description that will show what that means. But basically, if you're using an Enderman and activating a pressure plate that's high up using one, it's probably going to be vertically locational. I, th I haven't tested it, but I, be I believe it sh you should get around this by using a mob like this, because this is uh, two mobs. Um, but this is slightly taller, and this one's even slightly taller. Unfortunately, though, this is... Um, a, it's a really annoying height actually um, because so you have this here you can see this one is at zero the height the height it's at is 0.49 which is annoying because it means that if you were to um, put this on a fence um, yeah it means that it just just wouldn't activate um, a pressure plate so you can see how I can place a block here. It means that um, it means that the strider is literally one centimeter away from activating a pressure plate. But whatever, it's cool. The other problem we have um, with using mobs is suffocation. So uh, m pretty much all mobs suffocate when they are in a uh, in a solid block. The one exception to this, the vex, we can't use because naturally spawning vex is um, despawn after uh, a few seconds which is a shame um, and then you can't put armor stands in minecarts unfortunately since 1.8 uh, 1 1.9 uh, you can put a boat in a minecart but that's obviously got a bit of an annoying hitbox the one exception to this is the witch which you can push and it will take suffocation damage and then it will heal itself so as long as it's not permanently being suffocated a witch is a pretty good bet actually um, and just in case you're wondering, they do actually even heal themselves when they're summoned with a no AI tag, which means they fall within the redstone squid regulations. But anyway, that's enough of a tangent on this. Um, I hope that's enough to get people excited and experimenting with these mobs. Almost any mob could have a use. I just highlighted some potentially useful ones here. Um, but yeah. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the rest of the closing, which in my little setup example has broken, but that's okay. So we're going to go from when this dropper here powers. So these top pistons are going to get powered by the dropper here, which will push up their blocks, and it will also activate this torch burnout. Um, now, since they get powered at the same time, this will eventually sort of push the blocks out, because what's going to happen is this one's going to update first, and then this one afterwards. And you would think that would automatically break, because it would just push this block up into there. But it's not quite so bad, because... Um, due to the layout we have these powering here which means we have an immovable block here which means this can't push and basically what this means is when I activate that dropper um, the burnout's going to go and it'll activate the sideways one first and then it's and then the rest of the storage will work quite nicely um, it will eventually retract this, so it doesn't finish in this state, but that's okay because we can time pushing this in and pushing that up to work. 
And we do that simply by having a, actually quite a long line of repeaters um, along the bottom. So this timing just gets it right and it activates it by pushing up this armor stand, which is floated. I'll put another link in the description to talk about floated armor stands and that will push up and activate this pressure plate, which will both push in the, this block and also reactivate this top input here. So when we activate this, we'll get to see that. Nice. And so that's what happens to get the last block of storage into place. So that is how the entire bottom closing works. Lovely. OK, so now we're going to talk about the bottom opening. And we're going to start on that using the storage again. So it's, it, obviously, there's two sides of the storage. So it's made of two parts. One is the double extender, which is going to push all the blocks over. So we have three blocks there. It's going to push this over and then just retract it. Oops. Like so. And then the other side is going to just, uh, well, the burnout's going to break my example, but it will just put those in storage. So the way this is going to work is it's going to pull up these two armor stands. We have one floated one from before and one other one. And so if we just ignore the second one first, this here, we're just also going to remove that. This pressure plate is going to activate both pistons. This is like that as a double extender. That's actually locational. It's to do with the, the dust on there where it needs to power the back piston first. Unfortunately, that is locational, but again, stores quite hard. Um, so that's how we do the, do the extension. It's very, very simple. And then the first retraction is quite easy because by pulling up this second armor stand, we can push it onto a wooden pressure plate. Now, since the armor stand is only in it for a short amount of time, they, this arm, this light, uh, this weighted pressure plate will give a 10 game tick pulse and the wooden one a 20 game tick pulse. And that means that it will um, pull this piston back. And then what's going to happen is this piston here is going to retract. And what that's going to do is pull this arm stand up because it's floated in two directions meaning that this can pull up the arm stand there. You see, kind of annoying to build, but it's a valid technique. Um, and since it pulls it up while this piston is still retracting, it will power that like so. So if we activate the double here, we can see that it does a full extension. And we get two pulses into there. The second one, we just sort of I managed to time everything to ignore it. It's, it was actually quite a difficult little thing to do, but um, we, we managed it. Now the other side is sort of linked because as we know, this burnout is just going to spam and it's going to push these back and we don't really want that. So we take advantage of the fact that there's a fairly long pulse into here. So when the burnout starts, it'll first activate this one because obviously they're going to power them both at the same time but because since this one can't push it'll just pull this down and um, then this one will will spam a bit so we'll, we can see this in the um, in action like so now unfortunately it is going to then going to mess up afterwards but by doing some clever timings, we can uh, we can fix that. So there are two issues. One is that this piston is going to repower, and we can fix that by adding this piston, which we're going to need anyway for the piston tape. So what's going to happen in this case is it'll pull the block down, and then the block moving will update it, and it will get um, powered by this piston that gets butted which pushes it across, starting the piston tape. But there you see the other problem with this approach. Let me just do it again, just to be clear. What's going to happen is when it gets pushed across, it's going to get budded from that block there and push up, breaking the other block. And so we, the way we're going to avoid that and also stop the rest of the tape breaking is by timing a pulse to come along here and redirect this dust so it no longer powers this piston. And the way that looks is pretty cool. So you see 
Oh, no, that's my mistake. So the way this is going to work is quite cool. So this is pushed down, and then when we activate it, and I slow down the game, we can see it gets pushed up at just the right time so that that can then push up as it normally would. And then for the rest of the tape, this piston won't ever get powered because this is going to be redirected, which is very nice. I really like that bit. The timing here is quite specific. So we need to obviously give the right amount of pulses so it ends up here rather than here. But then this timing also has to be right for the piston tape and also to filter out the second pulse that comes from here because otherwise it can cause it can cause some problems. So this timing worked for the other stuff but it didn't really work for pushing this up at the right time. And so to add the extra delay that we needed I just added a dispenser here because this takes two ticks for it to turn on. So it gave me just enough time for, to make both timings work, which is, you know, it's quite cool. And now the final part of this is the tape, because we've stored all the blocks, all we have left is for the tape to go around. And this is, it's, con, it's formed of a few parts. So we have two sides, obviously. And so I wanted them both to have sort of these sort of smart piston approaches. So on this side, it's quite a simple one. So we have this armor stand, that when this pushes across and when it retracts, it'll get pulled across and it'll activate the pressure plate because there's a gap here in the piston. It'll get pulled into the gap, activate the pressure plate. But then when the when the piston finishes retracting, the arm sign kind of gets pushed back into this piston, deactivating the pressure plate. Now we can see this here. So it's just a smart piston effectively. It's a bit like in, bed, in the bedrock edition how you can make it so when a piston retracts it activates a, a target block with a trident on it. It's kind of a bit like that but using an arm stand and a uh, and what's it called? A pressure plate. I'm not entirely sure if that is how it works because when we run the data though we can see when we retract this and we get its position every single tick we can see it goes straight from being a uh, right at the you know the the edge of the block oops at this edge straight to that edge and it doesn't appear to be in any other positions except those ones so i'm not quite sure how it activates the pressure plate but it does so i'm not going to complain the other side um seems quite simple but was a bit of a, a bit annoying to build so we just base it off of this simple torch setup because I'm sure we a lot of us will know that this here will power the bottom piston then the top one just due to basic update order and it's especially nice in this case because if we have a piston here it will still power this one first which means we can send uh, when the when the sticky piston that's being cycled around the tape goes past it's no different to when there's just a block as far as the torch is concerned. To power this we're using a signal coming from a hopper um, and I'll show the exact case in a second, but we're using this technology here. So when you have a hopper minecart that's been pushed into another minecart, it can actually suck the items out. So as long as there's no gap at all, it can suck the items. And this can be expanded to having as many hoppers as you want. Um, it's really quite convenient. I assume this is because the minecart is 0.98 across, but it will suck items from anywhere within a one by one from its middle. I don't know whether that's true, but it would, it would make sense. Um, and the rule for this is that the minecart has, the hover minecart has to be no less than 0.3 of a block lower than the one it's trying to suck from. And that is because minecart is 0.7 tall, so it has to suck from uh, the block above it. Um, yeah, that's how it works. It's the same case as to if you were to have a a dropper um, or any other thing for that matter. There, it won't suck items from this because 0 0.3 above it, it doesn't it doesn't work out. But it will suck one from here. So it's a bit similar to that, but in working in minecarts. So if we go and look at the original build to see the context of this of this setup. The pressure plate will direct the pressure plate with the armor stand will directly power this dropper with an item, and that will send the item across via a minecart. This minecart here, 
into this hopper, which will send it into this hopper, which is sitting on soul sands, so it's slightly lower than a block. We shall then put it into this minecart hopper, into this minecart hopper here, which will then put it into there. This minecart hopper also can't pull items from this mine from this regular hopper because it's um, too uh, too far over that way, and that will then deliver its item to here. The item will then be returned quite simply by putting it into here, which then gets sorted into here. We'll deal with the item sorter later, but it goes into here, and then that puts it into a similar little clip, which puts it into this minecart, then into this one, which is sitting on top of the rim of the bell, which is why we use a bell here as opposed to a note block, which then is floated into this hopper, delivering the items back into here. Very nice. So that's how that loop works, and that's how we power the other side. But it doesn't deal with how we're going to stop the tape, because this has a full thing of items, because actually we need this to power every single time. Um, but we need to stop the tape somehow, and we're going to stop it by not powering this line, this input, again. Because every single part of the tape, we power this line, because that will mean that we can power the pistons into here, well, into one into these things which will pull down the final the final block um, so that's how we power it and it also deals with um, doing the next part of the tape because it will repower this piston here via these two repeaters and when we power this piston we also power this one and the dropper so effectively the the idea, the idea of the tape is we power this piston, when it retracts it powers this piston and also this dropper. The dropper sends its item into here, which powers this piston, then this piston, and then this torch here will also put one of its, one of its items into this minecart chest here, which is floated, into here, which will power this line, which will pull down, pull down the blocks and reactivate the tape for the next loop. Okay, so the part we want to stop is this um, getting a signal from here. And so we're going to do that by just having a counter. So we have it there's seven moves. So we get this one for free and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so we're going to have seven items. And the way we get our seven item count is by is it happens very early on in the door, it happens in the closing. So when this piston pushes up, it's going to push this hopper minecart, which is floated towards it, up. And due to the exact height of it on this B, uh, and due to the exact height of the minecart it sucks from, which is this minecart hopper, which in turn sucks items from this dropper here, um, it's going to push up, and just due to the due to the heights and how long it stays in the air, it will suck seven items out. I spent a while just looking for a solution like, like that because I knew there'd be one. So before, this minecart was sitting effectively at the height of a campfire, 0 0.4375, I believe, or something like that. Um, but in a lantern, because lanterns have an internal hitbox at that height. Um, and that means it could suck an item from, suck items from the dropper. Um, because it needs to be less sitting on less than the height of a slab to suck items from the hopper, as I showed a minute ago. Um, uh, and that meant that this clip here down here was easier and you didn't need to have a B uh, or any mob actually, you just use a minecart. But unfortunately, I kind of cheated and I, I couldn't work out a way of building that after the fact. I'd already made the showcase at that point, laziness. Um, and so I had to change it. So now it's sitting at 0 0.375, which is the height of a flower pot, which meant this minecart here had to sit slightly lower because otherwise it would suck items at this, at this level, which we can't have. Um, and so the correct height, just put it on a, on a B. You might have been wondering why I was using a lantern anyway, as opposed to just using a campfire, which is at the same height. This piston won't pull up the floated armor stand if it is sitting at anything um, lower than a slab. And so I needed to sit it above a slab and so a lantern has an internal hitbox at the height of a campfire which is good for the minecart but its top hitbox is 0 0.5625 like a boat um, so the the or, or a stone cutter so the arm stand could be pulled up 
but then obviously I couldn't build that, so I changed it to a soul sand. So now this has an internal hitbox of 0 0.375, which is what the minecart's sitting on, and then the, and then the armor sand is just sitting on the top, which is 0 0.875, and so it can be pulled from here. But anyway, that sends its seven items into here, which then pulls them down into here. Now, there's one problem with this, and that is that um, all seven items are going to be in here, but then when we start the tape, the seven items aren't going to be, an item isn't going to go straight from here all the way through this dropper out in one move. So we need a, effectively a waste move, um, like a waste move into here. And, we, and that's just to send the items into its halfway stage, which is this dropper here. So that when the tape starts properly, it can go straight from here and it will skip this dropper and go up. So we need an extra move into the tape. And we get that during the closing. So you might have noticed earlier I didn't mention this burnout. And this is here for two reasons. The first is to get these extra pulses. Because what's going to happen is um, when this turns off, this is a three tick, so it's going to give a few pulses. And that's going to send, I, send pulses not only into this target powering these, but it's also going to power this dropper. So it's going to send items from here and also from that one just to replenish them. And that will go down, but they'll actually get stuck at uh, in the minecart before this hopper because this four tick, due to the repeater chain bug, isn't going to turn off, meaning this hopper is going to be locked, which means that until the burnout is finished and these seven redstone ticks have passed, the items that get sent from here from the burnout and from the target powering here are going to get stuck in here which means that when when the burnout is finished we're already going to have some of the seven items in here which means that when these get released because the burnout is finished they're going to go through activate here and send one item from here into here so you'll end up during the closing with six items and one item and I can probably demonstrate this if I'm quick. So you can see we'll be getting our items here. And then as the burnout finishes, you heard the burnout happen there. We'll get a pulse through there, which will send its item into, into there. Which means now when we do the opening, it'll be able to skip from this dropper straight into that ARP minecart. Okay, so that is how most of the of most of the tape works. Um, while we're on this small tangent, I'll explain the other reason why we have this. Um, what's it called? The other reason why we have this burnout, and that is that it keeps this piston here extended because of this four tick powering it. And what that means is that when we power this top input, the signal coming down these repeaters it won't be able to push our storage piston out when we don't want it to. So just by using a torch burnout as a pulse extender and abusing the repeater chain bug, we get to you know, stop it breaking itself. Okay, so I believe there's only one more part to mention on the bottom here, at least one significant part, and that is the chickens. So why are there chickens, a cordon full of chickens making eggs, which then get thrown away? So, Basically the thing is, it comes down to the tape being a bit difficult. So what I'm going to do is just start the uh, start the opening until we get to the tape and I'm going to slow, slow down. So when we, send an, when we send this block up and across, like what will happen in a second, like so, we get it gets pushed across, and I don't want that to activate the torch burnout. the The block being pushed across can't activate the torch burnout, and that is so that when the tape finishes, um, that is so that when the tape finishes, this block being pushed across here doesn't activate the burnout again, pushing this block up because that would break it. So. We have a short time where the torch is in its cooldown where we can push the block across. And we do that just using the timings of the hoppers and the minecarts and everything. But 
when we activate this and we send our item through here and through here, I do want that to activate the burnout. And the reason is a bit tangential and it's not because the burnout actually does anything because it doesn't power any pistons. Um, like we don't want it to anyway. But when the piston is here, it's gonna it's gonna power just because it it will because that's that'll be a bud. Uh, actually, not even a yeah. Is that a bud? No, it'll just power it next to the. It'll just power the piston because it's next to it. It'll be oh, should have done that. So yeah, so the piston will be here and it will be pulsing. You might have noticed that when I did the whole tape. And if the timing is wrong, this piston won't be able to pull that block down because it will be in an extending or retracting state. And so basically, we time the tape to go around with the burnout so that when it gets to the end, it doesn't break anything. The burnout itself doesn't really contribute to the um, to the functioning of the tape, but we have to bear in mind the fact that the burnout is there so that we don't break the tape, if that makes sense. Um, and so we want it to power on the, we want the burnout to power when this signal turns off during the tape. And the way we're gonna do that, because by default, we don't have enough delay going into here for it to be when this pushes across, it's before the, the cooldown finishes, but then when it turns off, when, when this turns on, it will activate. There's a very small little gap there. And so in order to make it so that this here would activate the burnout, I wanted to delay the signal coming into here. And the way I do that is like so. When this gets a signal, an item goes into here, one, one of these items goes into here, it's going to turn this torch off. And then what, before that torch turns on, this, this hopper is gonna release an item. This puts its items into this micro hopper, which puts its items into here. So what it's gonna do is every time this gets an item, this is gonna send a second item and the signal and the pulse length is going to double. So it'll be a long pulse going into here, not just one item, but two items. And what that means is we get an extra eight game ticks of, uh, of leeway. So we get effectively this pulse here is eight game ticks later, meaning that this can activate the burnout. And then the only reason I'm using a chicken is because I couldn't find a way of getting the items back into here. If anyone can, go for it, it'll be cool. I don't actually really like using the chickens, but the way I deal with them is the items just come from here. So we use the sorter, gray items go into here, eggs go into here, and then they just get dropped out into this cauldron. It doesn't catch all of them, but it doesn't really matter. And I think in 1.17, you could fill that with lava to destroy them or just you know, just fill that with lava and make it a bit bigger, whatever. And uh, every time we get a signal to here, it not only releases an egg, but it destroys an egg from this dropper. So it's always balanced as everything should be. Now, I believe that is everything on the bottom that I wanted to mention. There'll be more specifics on how to build this in the um, uh, in the tutorial video, so that will explain things like you know this boat is here to stop the armor stand being pushed up by this piston, you know things like that, or the fact that this minecart is here to stop that minecart being pushed that way, you know that kind of thing is will, is what will be explained in the tutorial. Um, but I hope that was a valid explanation. I feel like I've been rambling this for the whole time. I didn't do very much preparation and it probably shows, but I hope you got something out of the video and I'll see you in the next one.